Welcome to EPG Patashala. This is a series of lectures in computer science. The topic we will be looking at is computer networks. It's the very first lecture that we will have on computer networks. So, what we will do is we will have an overview of computer networks. So, the learning objectives for this particular module are as follows. So, what we will do is we will get an overview of networks, identify various components that are there in getting a network to function, we will understand the architecture of networks both the hardware and software. So, it is basically a brush up of what you would already know. So, the moment we talk about networks there are certain common terms that come to our mind. I am just listing a few over here. I am sure you will be able to think of many more like this. The common terms that would come to our mind are internet that would, that would be almost the first thing that comes to your mind, cell phone, mobile, routers, switches, we talk about LAN, ethernet, LANs, cables, we we'll talk about wireless networks, we talk about 3G, 4G, talk about internet service providers, servers, Wi-Fi access point, protocols, you would have heard of protocols like TCP, UDP, IP and so on, the internet protocol IP. Then we talk of applications on the network like email, Facebook and so on. I am sure you can add to a number of other terms like this. I am just mentioning this term so that to get started we have some kind of an idea on how these things are all going to be interacting with one another. Okay. So, how do we normally perceive a network? So, that is the first thing. There are different uh, definitions that you could give for what a network is, but our normal perception of networks goes in the following manner. One is you can say it is an interconnection of computers or devices, that is a very simplistic definition that you can give. You can say it is something which allows easy and efficient communication among individuals through different devices. It provides access to shared resources, that is another way of looking at a network. You can say it provides remote access to machines and servers and you can also say it is made possible by different devices such as cables, connectors, switches, routers and so on. So, all these things are different angles or different perceptions of a network. So, let us take a pictorial view of a network. So, normally when we talk of a network this is the picture that would normally come to our mind. What does this picture look like? So, you can see that starting off from a local uh, network kind of situation where you have different uh, nodes or machines connected by means of a router, right? it could be, it could be um, a machine connected by means of a modem to a telephone line or can be directly machines connected to a, to a LAN kind of a network and there will be some kind of a router or a switch which is connected to some set of routers or switches which are there which are provided by some internet service provider and connected to other similar networks. So, this other similar network can be either a home network or it may be a company network or an institution network or your college network or whatever network. So, again in these networks there would be multiple LANs which are connected to by means of routers. There may be multiple switches or routers inside your uh, campus itself and there could also be wireless devices and mobile mobiles and laptops that could be connected and all these again would be connected by means of some kind of an internet service provider. And there would also be multiple such service providers who have different routers which are all interconnected and so on which gives you the entire global internet that we have today. So, this picture of a network is something that all of us must be familiar with. So, let us just take a closer look at this network structure. So, we can identify certain components that are there in this kind of a network structure. So, what you could look at is you can see that you have um, we can talk about normally what happens at the edge of a network and then what happens at the core of the network. So, we talk about network edge and network core. So, when we talk of network edge what we are typically talking about is the devices which are there at the edge of the network. So, we are talking about hosts which are running some applications. So, applications are ho and hosts are the two terms that we talk about when we talk about network edge. When you talk of network core this is what actually makes the different interconnection possible. So, the different devices that would constitute the network core would predominantly be I mean predominantly one of the, the device uh, router would be one of the devices. In addition to that of course, there may be other switches and so on and when we talk of network core we also have to remember that we are looking at how you can have a network of networks. So, that is another important aspect. In addition to the network edge and network core we also talk about access networks or physical media that is what allows the network edge to be connected to the network core. So, you can say for instance you have the um, different access networks like it may be through a modem or through maybe through Wi-Fi whatever and it could be different physical media that you could use. It could be an optical fiber, it could be a copper fiber, it could be um, wireless transmission, radio frequency transmission whatever. So, you have different communication links and different media which make that kind of an access possible. 
So, these are this is you can look at this as what constitutes the structure of a network. In addition to this to these hardware or these visible components that are there are some there is some uh, software component that is required and there are also some important um, aspect of networks that we talk about which goes under the term of protocols. So, the moment we talk of networks we always talk about protocols. So, network and protocols kind of go hand in hand right. So, any communication for it to take place we know that you need to have some kind of a protocol some kind of agreed upon format agreed upon sequence of messages that are required for um, the exchange to be successful and network is all about communication. So, give so obviously it is given that you will have a number of protocols that you need to understand in order to understand how networks function. So, let us let us look at um, the same thing at a little bit more of a detail. So, you are talking now about two end systems which form the network edge communicating with one another. So, there are different models in which these end systems could communicate with one another ok. What do they do? They actually run different application programs simple examples are your world wide web if you are looking at www as an application you have your web client which is your uh, browser on one end and you have the server the web server running on the other end and these two are talking to, uh, to each other using the network ok. Uh, so, 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 this kind of a model we say is a client server model. So, in the client server model you have a client program which host uh, a client host which requests for some data or for some service and the server is the one which is providing the service. So, client host requests and, the, and receives service from the server and you have the um, server which is providing that, sp that particular service. So, in the case of the world wide web for instance that is a clear example of a client server model. Similarly, you can have an email application where you have an email client accessing data from an email server. So, that is similar. So, this is an example of a client server model. Another model that the network also allows you to have is what is called as a peer to peer model. So, in a peer to peer model the uh, interaction between the two hosts is symmetric in the sense that it is not that one is that the function of one is different from the other both of them do similar functions. So, we say it is a symmetric interaction. So, it is not that one request and the other uh, sends it anybody could request and the anybody else could provide a service. An example of this would be teleconferencing where you know you, you have a teleconference. So, each person is talking the others are listening and so on. So, this is an example. So, you can have a client server model or it could be a peer to peer model in which different applications could use the network to talk to each other ok. Now, coming to the network core. So, we talked about the network edge now we are looking at the network core. So, if you look at the network core you can see that it is a mesh of interconnected routers ok. So, the fundamental question that we have here is how exactly is the data transferred through this net through this network of routers ok. So, uh, if you remember uh, there are normally two ways in which this is done we talk about what is called as a circuit switching mechanism and a packet switching mechanism. So, in the case of a circuit switching mechanism what you would do is you would have a dedicated circuit or a path which is set up before the trans data transfer is made and data will be transferred along that particular path. So, this happens um, in the case of telephone networks for instance this is the me mechanism that is often employed the traditional telephone networks. So, where you will have a dedicated circuit per call or in the case of uh, data transfer we dedicated circuit per data transfer or data transaction. The other option is packet switching. In packet switching what we do is the data that needs to be sent is sent as discrete packets or in discrete chunks and as the data goes by it is forwarded from one router to, the, to another router until it reaches the end machine that it is destined for. So, we have these two options the circuit switching option and the packet switching option and when we talk of network and we talk of data predominantly we go in for the packet switching option your IP networks that we have today are all packet switch networks. So, we talk about IP packets IP packets being sent from one router to another being forwarded from one router to another until they reach the destination network. So, we talked about a network edge and network um, core the next thing to look at look at is the access network that is how do the end systems connect to the edge router. Now, remember that where they are going to connect is basically to the edge routers you can see that these would be the edge routers and these are the core ok. So, the end systems basically connect to this edge router. So, how do they connect to the edge router? So, if it is a residential access you could have residential access networks then institutional access networks like a school or a company or you can have mobile access networks. So, these are different options for each of these again. So, if you look at residential access it could be a point to point access as in the case of a dial up modem dial up via modem. So, what you do in this case is you have your machine connected by means of a modem through a telephone line connected to a um, to a to a router 
Uh, normally, you get access of about 56 kilobits per second with this. this is pretty slow in the sense of the kind of data rates that we talk about today. But you still have this option of doing a dial up via modem. Another option that we have is have an ISDN network. ISDN stands for Integrated Services Digital Network, which is a 128 kilobit per second all digital connector router. So, your devices could be connected to the router by means of a digital connection. So, if you were using a modem, remember that your uh, telephone line connection is still analog. So, there is actually a uh, modulation taking place there to convert your digital data to analog signals and send it over there. Whereas, in the case of ISDN, it is an all digital connection to the, route, to the router. Another option that we have today which is becoming more and more popular is ADSL which is the asymmetric digital subscriber line. So, this provides you about uh, 1 to 5 megabit per second from home to router and 8 to 52 megabit per second data rates from router to home. You can see that it is called asymmetric the reason being that the uplink that is when you are transferring data from home to router it is a lower uh, data rate and when you are downloading the downlink that is from router to home you have a higher data rate. So, which is why it gets the name as the asymmetric digital subscriber line. Other options that we have for residential access would be uh, cable modems which could be through hybrid fiber coaxial uh, cables. So, again these are asymmetric with downstreams uh, of 10 megabit per second and upstream of 1 megabit per second. Notice that upstream normally is less data rate than downstream. The answer is obvious because we typically are getting lot of data from the network rather than uploading data lot of data to the network. Another option that we have is you could have a network of cable and fibers attached um, which, is, which attaches homes to the ISP router. So, these are different options that are possible. So, in this case you are providing some kind of a shared access to the router among homes. So, these are different options that we have when you talk of residential access. When it comes to institutional access or local area networks, um, typically any company or a university local area network is the one which will connect the end systems to the edge router. Um, Ethernet is one of the uh, popular local area networks uh, a LAN technology that is used and this provide that you could either have a shared or dedicated cable which is connecting the end systems to the routers. Uh, we typically have what are called as Ethernet switches using which we connect the different uh, nodes to the routers. And, um, and data rates that you can have vary from 10 megabit per second all the way up to 10 gigabit per second. So, it, uh, earlier when in Ethernet started it was a 10 megabit per second Ethernet, but right, but now we talk about gigabit Ethernet. So, that is the kind of data rates that you can get with the um, local area networks. Another option that we have is wireless access networks. So, your wireless access networks again remember that um, the wireless space is shared. So, it is a shared uh, access that we need. So, the wireless access point will, so you need have some, some kind of an access point or a base station. So, this wireless access point will be shared by the different uh, end machines and that will be the one which will connect to the router. So, you can see that there are multiple wireless devices here. So, these devices use this base station, they share this base station and through that they connect to the router. Okay. So, typically you can look at wireless LANs um, where uh, if you compare it with an Ethernet LAN all that has been done spectrum replaces the wires that we had in the case of Ethernet LAN. So, wireless lines of course, there is there is some difference in terms of the access technology as well. So, um, but that apart you can say that uh, one of the fundamental differences is that you would have wires there which is replaced with the radio spectrum here in terms of the physical media that is used for the data transfer. Other than that you could also have wider area wireless access CDPD cell cellular digital packet data and you could have wireless access to ISP routers now via cellular network. So, you could use your cellular network, your 3G network, 4G network and so on to connect to the router. So, these are again different options that are becoming available now. So, coming to the physical media that we have to connect up these different uh, devices or the different networks. Um, so, we talk about guided media and we talk about unguided media. So, what do we mean by guided and unguided? So, when you talk of guided media, we are talking about signals uh, propagating in solid media like copper or fiber. So, where the, the propagation of the signal is guided by the media itself. So, when you talk of unguided media, there is a, a free propagation of the signals. For example, as, a, as we have in the case of radio transmission, radio wave transmission and so on. So, on the whole physical link is the one which uh, takes which takes the responsibility for transmit or propagating the bits across the link. Okay, so, that across I mean from one end to the other end. So, when we talk of guided media, one example of guided media is twisted pair cables. So, um, all of you would be familiar with this kind of a twisted pair where you have uh, a pair of cables twisted uh, in this manner typically used with insulated copper wires. So, there are different categories of cable that we talk about category 3 cable, category 5 cable and so on. 
the category refers to the kind of data rates it can support you can in a sense you can see it's the quality of the cable so depending on the quality of the cable it is used for um, for supporting higher data rates your cat 3 can support only up to 10 mbps whereas cat 5 could go up to 100 mbps ethernet and so on another option that we have with respect to uh, physical media in terms of wired access is coaxial cable so in the case of coaxial cable um, you will be familiar with the coaxial cable again you would have seen this with in when you are using your tv connections and so on so you will find that there is a central uh, inner uh, wire and then there is um, another set of wire which is around it okay so you have some kind of a signal carrier which is your inner wire and then there is a shield okay so you have you are talking about a sh shield and an, a signal carrier within that uh, when we talk of um, coaxial cable there are again two modes of uh, transmission we talk about we talk about baseband transmission and broadband uh, transmission so in case of baseband it's a single channel on the cable in case of broadband you would have could have multiple channels on the cable and again you could have bidirectional data transfer with coaxial cable uh, when you go for fiber optic cable uh, what you have is again you would have seen this uh, optical fibers right especially uh, you may have seen some some different uh, even um, devices or you could have looked at some there are also table lamps which come with this kind of uh, fiber optic cable so if you um, so if you see what you see it's a thin uh, thin it will almost look like a thin plastic but you will see that there is light coming out of the thin pl plastic so it's actually not plastic but it's more of a glass fiber which is carrying light pulses so you can have very high speeds of operation with fiber optic cables typically your gigabit ethernets are done with fiber optic cables and you we talk about uh, data rates point to point data tra data transfers of 5 gigabit per second and above and what is very important about fiber optic cable is that they also have very low error rates compared to the other uh, coaxial and the um, twisted pair cables and so on if you look at the physical um, and another the coming to the other physical media which is uh, radio or the uh, electromagnetic spectrum so we talk whenever we talk of radio waves we're talking about the signals which are carried in the electromagnetic spectrum there's no physical wire again it is bidirectional bidirectional sense you can have data transfer in both directions actually you, it would even be okay to say that it is omnidirectional because it spreads in all directions of course if you have a directional antenna then you could kind of um, restrict the direction but it kind of spreads in all directions what we are, need to be aware of the moment we talk about radio frequency signals is that there are many other effects of the environment that that will that could that need to be taken into account so the propagation environment that we have could affect different uh, the the actual data the signal transfer by means of these different uh, phenomena it could be reflection or it could be some obstruction by objects or it could be interference so these are additional things that one needs to be aware of and take care of when you when you very when you're working with wireless uh, data transfer with radio frequency signals so the different types of radio links that we have you could have microwave link or you could have lan wireless lan it could be wide area cellular network and then you could have satellite networks as well so microwave uh, networks will give you up to 45 megabit per second channels a wireless lan anywhere between 10 megabit per second to 5 gigabit per second a wide area i would give you a megabit per second and gigabit per second data transfer satellites you could have up to 50 megabit per second channels or multiple smaller channels uh, only thing to uh, to, uh, to remember about satellite transmission is that the end to end delays can be quite high of the order of milliseconds so it's about 270 milliseconds end to end delay that we have when we have the uh, transfer via satellite so having uh, looked at these physical components and the physical media that we have for a network to work the next thing to understand is what what's required in terms of the protocols right so we talked we said that network is full of protocols so we need to understand what is meant by protocol i'm sure you're all aware of what is what a protocol is but this just to have a brush up of what we are what we already know so when we talk of protocols as uh, communication among humans we have so many different uh, what unwritten or unsaid protocols that we use for instance when you say what's the time or hi, i have a question before you start uh, asking a question or you know you have these basic introductions of you know you say hello somebody else says hello and then you start talking and so on all these are kind of unwritten protocols so um what what we mean when we when to uh, talk of this kind of a protocol is that there is a particular set of message that is exchanged and there are some certain order in which these things are done okay and there are certain specific actions which are taken when some messages sent or when messages exchanged okay so the same thing is true about network protocols as well so the um, difficulty we have is in the case of human protocols there is always some kind of an understanding that a human has which you mean which you could not which you may not be able to expect a machine to have right so we're talking about machines talking rather than humans so 
all communication has to be governed by some very well defined protocols. You cannot have anything undefined. So, that is important part of the network protocol. So, when you talk of network protocols again we talk about what are the specific messages that need to be sent and what are the specific actions to be taken when the messages are received or when other events happen and so on. Okay? So, this is what is normally defined when we talk of a protocol. Look at a protocol, let us look at the various um, things that we need to make sure are very well defined. So, a protocol should define the format of the message that is being sent, the order in which the messages are sent and received among the network entities and the actions taken on message transmission and on message receipt. When you transmit or transfer a message what is it that you need to do on receiving what you need to do all these things typically have to be specified very well. So, format in the sense that exactly what will be the um, what what will be the first byte that is sent or the first bit that will be sent, how many uh, bits will be there in a message, what will be the size of the message that is sent all these things would come in the format. Order of messages in the sense that you may send a hello message before you send some other the actual data. Okay, so, what is the order in which messages to be, to be sent and uh, if you are sending some message are you to receive some kind of an acknowledgement or not all those things also will come under under the um, and the protocol uh, definition or the format that is needs to be specified. So, now we will look at the very famili the fam familiar protocol stack that we have the internet protocol stack. Now, if you uh, remember the different functions that we have in a network are normally organized in the form of layers. So, at each layer there are multiple protocols at work which allow that layers functionality to be carried out. So, starting up starting from bottom and going up to the application. So, at the bottom most layer we have the physical link right. So, this is where the actual bits are converted into signals and sent on the wire. Then you have a data link layer right or a set of protocols for the data link layer which provides the actual data transfer between the two networking elements. Then you have the networking uh, layer where which is which is the one which takes care of routing your packets from one network to another network through various routers and so on. And then you have the transport layer which is responsible for the host to host uh, data transfer or from a process to process data transfer. So, what the transport layer will do is identify to which application the data is coming from and deliver it to the correct application on the other side. And at the application layer itself there are multiple protocols that are used which will vary depending on the um, application that we have. So, this is a bottom up understanding of the networks. We could also have a top down approach to networks where we start off with the application where you say that okay, these are the applications I am familiar with as I do file transfer, I do mail transfer, I do web browsing. So, what are the protocols I use for that? Yes, I know I have heard of something called FTP which is used for file transfer, the file transfer protocol, SMTP which is the simple uh, mail transfer protocol, HTTP which is the uh, protocol which is hypertext transfer protocol used for web browsing and so on. Then I know that these protocols will run on either something called a TCP protocol or a UDP protocol. Now, TCP and UDP are both transport layer protocols okay, which are responsible for transporting my data from one end to the other end. And these protocols run using the IP network. So, I have the, net, uh, the IP protocol and different routing protocols which are responsible for this networking layer. And these protocols when they when uh, when these data uh, are, are further to be carried from one link to another link, the links could be either a point to point link or ethernet or different types of links. So, I have different link layer protocols which will take care of um, transferring data across those links. So, PPP which is point to point protocol, ethernet they are all examples of link layer protocols. And then finally, is your physical la layer where the bits get bits converted into signals and sent. So, there again you may have protocols like sonnet which is used for uh, optical fiber and so on. So, this is our um, internet protocol stack and the um, different pro um, and the different layers and the different protocols that we have at these different layers. Now, the question that we always ask, ask is why do we have this kind of a layering? The idea of having layering is basically to um, subdivide the problem and make it a more manageable solution. So, you can see that each layer that we have here right will provide some kind of a service to the layer which is about. So, the, the lower layer provides service to the higher layer. So, that is what we say. So, each layer relies on the services which are from a layer below and it exports services to the layer above. So, you can see that every layer that you have here is it is either providing a it is providing a service to this uh, to a layer above it right it is export its services to a layer above and it is using the services of the layer below. And we have some very well defined interfaces between the layers 
which will define how this interaction between the layers will take place. Another advantage of having layers is that you can hide the implementation details and you could change one layer without really affecting the others. For instance, if you were to change uh, from uh, introducing point to point protocol, suppose you were to change to ethernet uh, network, you will not have to change the layers above, you only need to change the link and maybe the physical layers. So, you are only changing uh, one or two components, not all the components that are there. So, it makes maintenance of the network and development of the network also easier, so which is why we go in for this layered option when it comes to network design. So, with the layering uh, in place, so you can see that you have some kind, you, you have a physical communication at one level and you have a logical communication that takes place at, uh, at another level. So, each layer that we talked about, see if you looked at these five layers, these five layers exist on almost all the machines that you have in a network, right. So, you can see that the layer is kind of distributed. So, I have an application layer on this machine, I have an application here, I have an application layer here and I have an application layer here. Similarly, you have transport layers on each of these machines, network layer on each of these machines. At the routers again, you will see that there is a network layer. There is no transport and application layer at the routers because there is no necessity of that functionality. The router is only doing a network layer job. So, you will see that only those layers are here. This also tells you another advantage that we have of our um, layered model, right. You can see that in a router when I do not require an application or a transport layer function that need not be there. I do not have to complicate my router by having that, those as well. So, these are certain advantages that you can see of using this kind of a layered model, ok. So, basically the layer is kind of distributed and the entities which implement the functions are there at each node, ok. So, entities perform the actions and exchange messages with their peers. So, you can see this is what will happen. So, if you look at this, an application will give the data to the transport. The transport we said is responsible for end to end data transfer. So, you can see that this, this kind of a data transfer would take place, right. So, you can see this will send data to this and this will send back an acknowledgement to this. Similarly, uh, but if you look at the physical communication, so this was our logical communication where we only worried about data going from transport to transport. But if you look at the physical communication, how would the data flow? It will go through all the layers. So, it would go through these different layers, through the physical media, come through the physical media over here, move up to the network layer, again come down via the physical media and then again through the physical media, come to the physical layer here and then move up to this. So, you can see that with layering you understand both what happens physically in terms of physical communication and also in terms of the logical communication. So, this is the advantage that we get in terms of layering that you can look at it at different levels of abstraction and through that you can uh, uh, design and devise your networks in the manner that we want. For this layering to work, so let us see how what is the uh, function that is also required. So, we use two things, one called encapsulation and the other called decapsulation. So, what happens is when the data goes from one layer to another layer, typically what happens is that um, you have a message and to this message every layer adds a part of uh, add some additional information which we call as the header information. Now, this header information along with the message that was received becomes part of the message that goes to the lower layer. So, you can see that transport is adding its header HT and when it goes to the network layer HN will add its header to it in addition to this HT which exists. When it comes to the link layer you have a HL added by the link layer you have your HL, HN and HT. So, on the physical layer it is all these things together which are converted and sent to the other side. And on the other side you can see that similarly the physical layer will look at this HL, remove this header and pass it on to the link layer. That will remove the, uh, the link layer header and pass it on to the network layer and similarly HN will be removed and passed to the transport layer. That will remove that its header and pass it on to the application layer, right. So, this is basically how the data flows and we, we call this job of adding headers as encapsulation and removing headers as decapsulation. So, this is uh, one of the important aspects of understanding how the network functions. So, another uh, model that we have with respect to uh, networks is the OSI model. We need to talk about this at least for a historical perspective. So, you can see that in this case there are 7 layers in the network. So, you have your application layer and then these other 5 that we 4 that we talked about transport, network, data link and physical. In addition to that there are also 2 other layers one called the presentation layer and another called the sessions layer. Now, these 2 are not there in the TCP IP model which means that they are, they are absorbed either as part of the application or as part of the transport, ok. Other than that the functioning, the encapsulation, decapsulation other things are very similar to what you what we have in the case of our current IP networks or TCP IP model. So, with this uh, perspective of networks what we have basically tried to do in this very first uh, uh, talk is that 
we've provided a summary of the different components that we have, both at the network edge and the network core, and how the network is accessed. And an overview of protocols in terms of stack, how we need layering of protocols, how the data flow takes place, both logical and physical, okay, and uh, some of the standards. So, we'll continue with other details in the next lecture. Thank you.